Our next speaker this morning, or this afternoon, actually, <laughs> is Tiffany Schultz. Um, Tiffany is an environmental specialist with MPCA, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. She's going to be presenting on assessing habitat improvement effectiveness for stream restoration work in Rice Creek, Minnesota. And she's bravely working in that space of effectiveness monitoring. So it's often tri tricky to accomplish and hard to get out in front of. So um, we're thrilled to have her collaborating on restoration work in Minnesota. All right. Thanks, Sarah, for that nice introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking today about habitat improvement effectiveness um, and a project we've been working on uh, pretty recently in, in Rice Creek. So just to give you a little background here about where we are in the world, this is a map of the uh, Rice Creek area. Um, Rice Creek is in the Root River watershed, Fillmore County. Um, it's a designated trout stream. It is heavily influenced by karst, uh, many sinkholes in the watershed fed by springs. Um, it, if you've ever traveled on Highway 52 from Chatfield to Preston, you've crossed over Rice Creek. Um, and so um, we found back in around 2010, uh, we assessed the stream for fish and macroinvertebrates and we found it to be impaired. Um, so we've had some previous interest in the stream. And last year uh, we sat down with TU um, and had a discussion, Dusty Hoffman, um, and found out that Rice Creek was about to get a large habitat improvement project through the Lessard Sands um, Fund. And so that um, really piqued our interest and which led to this kind of coordinated effort that I'm gonna discuss further today. Um, overall, the project proposal um, talked about, you know, habitat and eroding banks as limiting the trout population. Of course, this was interest to us because we had studied the stream and found basically the same concern. Um, and we identified those you know, those things like habitat being stressful to the fish in the macroinvertebrate communities. So here's a basic map um, of the project area. The entire cold water stream section is about three miles long, shown in blue. Um, and so this is the lower end of Rice Creek and it meets the, the middle branch of the Root River there. You can see on the top part of the screen, uh, the middle branch of the Root River is a lot, quite a bit larger. It's warm water. Um, so a very large portion of this stream will undergo a complete transformation. You can see the upstream project, um, the down point and the, and the end point, or the upstream end point and the downstream end point. And then I'll draw your attention to the place where we did our biological sampling, which was within this reach um, where the orange square is. And so that's where we collected our biological data. So the plan in Rice Creek, um, what does it include? So this, this plan includes a number of things that are gonna make habitat better. As you can see in the photo here, um, there are some things wrong with this, the habitat on this stream currently. Um, and so a number of different things, uh, this, this plan is gonna include sloping back, seeding um, stream banks, reconnecting the flood plain. Uh, deepening and narrowing the stream. As you can see, it's rather incised um, and cut down, placing in-stream habitat cover, things like root wads and, and lunker, or, um, toll wood and things like that, and then designated cattle crossings. As you can see, cattle are utilizing this reach um, pretty significantly. So what you're seeing here, this, this particular stream section is the location of where we um, had biological monitoring. So thinking back to the previous slides where the orange square was, that's that's what you're seeing here. Here's a general timeline of the project and kind of the related data and information that we have um, going into this. And so 2008 was the first time we had visited the stream. Um, and that was in 2008. Um, we sampled it for fish and macroinvertebrates. Shortly after that, we identified it as being impaired. We then revisited it in 2018. Um, determined no change in status, still impaired for fish and macroinvertebrates. Then we had the discussion with Dusty um, at TU about the project, and we said, let's really um, try to get another year of data, because if we could get another year of data before the project, that would be super helpful. Um, ideally, we probably would have more than three samples, uh, biological samples, but the fact that we could get three um, is pretty huge. And so then in addition to this, I should point out that the DNR has fish surveys historically on Rice Creek. So we can also use those um, from a fish standpoint, but 
Um, we have fish and macroinvertebrates at these sample at this sample site, so that's um, kind of the, a layer of data that we'll provide um, in our data collection. So then, the project itself is scheduled to start next year, so it's going to be phased, and I believe the goal is through 2023-2024. Um, and so then we'll have to give it a little bit of a break and probably start post-project monitoring around 2025, maybe through 2030, depending on on what gets decided there. Um, you know, the longer we can continue monitoring here, the better. But, you know, this is kind of new territory. It's not something that we really have done a lot of. Um, and so the post-project timeline and activities are very much to be determined. Uh, but hopefully in the end, it will help us understand, you know, how long the project will be effective, if changes are evident and when they occur. Um, but yeah, we really won't know until we start kind of launching into that post project monitoring. And so very much to be determined. So just want to take a quick step back almost and let people know <clears throat> kind of how our MPCA work ties into all of this and, and where we kind of came into this. Um, I want to give that background because I think it's pretty important. So the first thing I'll draw your attention to is the map of the biological stations. So the map of Minnesota there with all the, the gray dots. Those are places where we've collected biological data, so fish and macroinvertebrate communities. And so at each of those points, we look at those communities and then um, use a tool called the IBI, Index of Biological Integrity, to assess those fish and bug communities. Um, so if they don't meet our standards, they end up on the impaired waters list. And so um, when that happens, when we find a stream to not be, you know, adequate for fish or macroinvertebrates, and I'll keep saying bugs because bugs is my shorthand for macroinvertebrates. Um, when we find that they're not meeting standards, that trips another process called stressor identification. And that is essentially my job. I'm one of a dozen people who do this in the state. And so um, that's why I'm here talking about this today. I don't actually go out and collect the data. I just get to use it and then figure out um, what's causing these impairments. And so that can be a number of things. So we go through the stressor ID process, um, trying to understand stream health and looking at the different stressors and determining what it is that's causing the impairment. It could be anything from habitat to other water chemistry parameters like nitrate or oxygen. It could be temperature, it could be, um, anything that, that we can identify causing um, the issues to the biology. So you can see, if you look to the, to the right there, the pie chart shows that in Southeast Minnesota, more often than not, when we're looking at these sites, what we see or what we find are more macroinvertebrate impairments um, than fish impairments. And so our fish generally are doing pretty well. Um, and so, the macroinvertebrates are a different piece. And so it's really important for us to try to understand this bug component additionally um, to, to figure out what that's telling us. And so we know in the case of Rice Creek that fish and bugs are both suffering. And so the question is how much can a habitat improvement project change aquatic life health for fish and for bugs? Um, so that's kind of one of the things we're, we're trying to, to understand with a project like this. So then if you start looking at um, where we've done or where habitat improvement projects have been done and where we've had biological monitoring stations, that's what this map is meant to show. The left map is the habitat improvement project locations that we know of from about the last 30 years. Um, so this is a layer done by the Minnesota DNR. If we overlay that with our biological monitoring stations, so all those places we've collected fish and bugs or macroinvertebrates in Southeast, um, we can start to kind of build potentially some things to look at. However, um, you know, you look at it and you think, wow, there's all these opportunities to look at data and evaluate how habitats, look, you know, contributing or making a difference with the biology. And the reality is it's not quite that simple. Um, so it gets complicated really fast. And so um, there's a bit of a disconnect because all of these projects are slightly different. They mean different things on different streams. They're different types of projects. Um, a lot of these projects also are directed on streams with high angler interest, and those are not usually the streams that are impaired. And so <clears throat> with our data, and when we're kind of doing evaluations on streams, we're generally focused more on the impaired streams than the non-impaired streams. 
Um, and then if you look at where we have a biological monitoring stations, they don't always intersect in the same places where there's habitat improvement work. Um, it sort of looks like this when you look at, at the map, um, but if you zoom in, you'll see the dot um, is located just upstream of where, you know, the whole restoration reach was or for, what, for whatever example, you know, you choose it just things don't always seem to align. And then we also have the complicated nature of timing. And so some of these projects, let's say they were put in in 2010 and our biological sampling didn't occur till 2012, then there's a disconnect there. And then lastly, I think ideally we would have multiple biological samples prior to a restoration project on a stream and then we could go back and remeasure. Um, and that's you know just not always the case. And so I know there's a more integrated effort, um, a formal project to, a comp to do a comprehensive evaluation on HI work um, by Minnesota DNR, Doug Dieterman, maybe you've heard about that. Um, so that's, that's a separate, more strategic um, effort, but you know, is kind of looking at a similar thing here in trying to determine effectiveness of these projects and how to measure that. Um, so anyway, get in touch with Doug if you're interested in more details on that, but um, he's got a separate project going on, but I just want to make it clear that this isn't really affiliated with that project, but we're, we're talking and, and getting ideas from each other on, on kind of how we can continue to do this, this kind of analysis. So Rice Creek, um, for all those reasons I kind of mentioned, becomes a really good candidate to look at this because we have multiple samples, so we have a really good, you know, a decent pre-project data set that we haven't really had in a lot of other places. Um, the work also directly intersects the monitoring location. So um, we know we're in the right spot. The timing is really good. So we have a good set of samples leading up to the project and the, good, the timing is about right. It's also impaired. And so most projects um, that have occurred previously, like I mentioned, they're not on impaired streams. They're not on streams that are suffering as much as Rice Creek. And so um, that, is, that is of interest. And I think it's a unique opportunity to document change. And so I'm really interested in, you know, seeing what maybe the fish can do, but uh, also really, you know, how this would impact the bug community. So if you look at this scale on the bottom of the screen, it's, you know, just this imaginary scale that I, I found on the internet. But if you put um, you know, Rice Creek is not doing so well. You know, it's kind of in the orange category for both fish and macroinvertebrates. And the goal is to restore it to this green section. It has a ways to go, but, you know, a lot of the other stream reaches, like I mentioned, that have had habitat work previously, they don't have as far to go. And so my thought is, if we have farther to change a stream, it's probably going to be easier to measure um, that change and how much of an impact it's made when we have farther to, to, to go. And so our overall interest generally is just, you know, kind of telling the story of stream health and the question that remains to be seen and something we don't know yet, but um, won't really know until we gather the data is, you know, how far are we able to move the needle just by fixing habitat alone? Is it enough to restore the stream to a goal condition? You know, how, co how close can we get to that? by just looking at habitat. And that's, you know, knowing that there's other things going on in this stream that aren't going to be fixed simultaneously, but, but that habitat will be. And so I think it's possible that the, this stream could see big changes. And I think it's because it comes back to habitat being a foundational piece. You know, it's vital to the health of any stream. It may be one of the things that plays the largest influence on whether or not we see a healthy community. Um, and so you might be wondering, well, what is habitat stress? Like if you identify habitat as a stressor, what does that even mean? Um, and it's important to understand that habitat, you know, encompasses all the things in the stream, how um, the fish and the macroinvertebrates, they live, eat, reproduce. Um, and so habitat can be dynamic and variable and stress can mean a number of different things. It can mean lack of habitat we'd expect to see in certain streams like um, our cold water streams, we expect some rocky substrates and adequate cover, good riffles, less, you know, not a bunch of embedded substrates, pool depth and things like that. And so a lot of our habitat issues often relates to sediment. Um, and so that's, that's a big part of it. And so Southeast Minnesota really has some unique challenges in that regard. 
Um, we have slopes that are steep with the karst topography, the hydrology and bed loads. Um, our streams are flashy and they are violent at times. Um, so that can really wreak havoc on habitats, especially for bugs. Um, and they may be more susceptible to these you know, changes than, than fish. And so when you couple that with the fact that in Southeast Minnesota, we have sensitive cold water species of fish and bugs, they just won't tolerate these kinds of things as readily as you know, a more tolerant warm water fish would. And we, we do find that habitat is our most common stressor, not only in Southeast Minnesota, but statewide. If we look at all the stressors that we've identified in many, many streams, habitat is number one. 80% um, of our streams have a habitat um, related issue. And so it's common, we see it a lot. Um, the macroinvertebrates though, what we're seeing in some streams is that if the habitat is really good there and fairly stable, um, we can see some chemical issues like high nitrate and the, and the macroinvertebrates can still be okay. But as soon as the habitat starts to degrade, um, things can go south, especially when you start adding other stressors into the mix. So in addition to getting biological samples last year, we pushed to get some additional data um, to better characterize the existing habitat. Uh, we went out last fall and we did something called a quantitative habitat assessment. Um, and that's just a really um, detailed habitat assessment. You can see uh, the tr there's 13 different transects that you take through the sample reach. Um, and so uh, this photo here is of Dusty Hoffman and Don Parsons, a great volunteer that came out. They both came out with me and we did this habitat assessment. Um, so they're pictured here doing one of the transects in the stream. And so um, they're looking at water depth, substrates, um, and all sorts of different measures of the habitat. And then we've got all of this, you know, really good detailed habitat data available that we can use to compare post-project. Um, we also have the MSHA, which is kind of a more all-encompassing habitat um, tool that we can use to kind of determine the habitat um, conditions. So we'll have that along with um, geomorphology surveys that have been done as part of the project so we can look at slopes and and different things um, related to kind of the physical nature of the stream aside from the biology but kind of the nuts and bolts of it all is really you know how can we how do we expect to measure these changes and so this is all just in theory kind of what we have for ideas right now um, so just like we do my job is to do stress identification work figure out what's causing the impairment we can use the same tools to identify an impairment as we use, can use to determine if it got better. Um, so I would like to coin a new term called reverse stressor identification. Um, and so these are the things that I'm hoping that we can look at to kind of determine if this project was effective and if it changed the communities. So one of the things is gonna be, you know, kind of naturally the IBI score. You know, it's the one kind of key measure of stream health, but it's not the only indicator of health or success. And I don't think we should look at that as the only thing. So there's other things that we look at. And so there's hundreds and hundreds of these things called metrics that we can look at related to the community. And it looks at the different aspects or measures um, of that community, kind of the more specifics. And so what I've listed here are a few examples of metrics for each fish and macroinvertebrates. And so these are some examples of things we look at for stressor ID work when we're trying to kind of hone in on whether or not we believe habitat is a problem in a stream. We'll look at the physical nature of what we see and then we'll look for a corresponding um, response in the metrics or in the community that can support what we, what we see in the field. So in Rice Creek, for example, there were a lot of pioneering fish species. So if you don't know what that means, it's pioneers are like the first to invade after disturbance. So on heavily disturbed systems, you'll see more pioneers. Those are things like in this case, we saw you know creek, creek chubs and johnny darters. So those are considered pioneers. So in theory, if the habitat's improved, hopefully those fish will not be able to thrive in this, these conditions and we'll see decreases. Conversely, we might see increases in things like riffle dwelling species, piscivores, or lithophilic spawners. Those trout would fit into all of those categories. And so if, you know, the habitat increases, in theory, the trout should increase. Um, and so we may see increases in those metrics as well. Not to mention, there's other things we can look at 
um, you know, potentially in partnering with DNR and their surveys, we can find out things about trout sizes and biomass and things like that. Um, but that would be from their, their information. Um, in terms of the macroinvertebrates, we could look at things like um, not only the IBI score, but different metrics like clingers. So clingers would be any kind of bug that would cling to the rocky substrate. So in theory, you know, if the habitat is improved, you have more rocky substrate, you're not only going to have more clingers, but you should have more EPT taxa. So your um, mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies. Those are, you know, classic bugs that will not tolerate poor habitat conditions. Similarly, things like um, worms and snails, so your legless individuals and your burrowers, those things should decrease if the habitat conditions improve. Um, and then, you know, kind of as mentioned before, the habitat and geomorphology side of things, so that will then look at the physical aspect. We can look at the MSHA scores. Did they increase? Do we have, you know, improvements in stream width and depth, riffle percent, cover, substrates, slopes, all those different things that we can look at to kind of assess. So um, just kind of some next steps here in summary. Habitat, you know, I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but so important to our streams and it's a limiting factor to many. Uh, this project's gonna be completed soon, coming up this year it'll start. Um, we have some good, you know, beginnings of post-project plans, but that's kind of to be determined on exactly what we do, but hopefully we can get a, some biological sampling and habitat um, sampling done, similar to what we did this year, um, and then continue to compile and share data. So I think Rice Creek has the great, you know, a great potential to show changes in aquatic life health, and so I'm excited for the results. Um, hopefully we can use this data to leverage and influence knowledge of restoration work, uh, which I think is pretty important, and um, hopefully kind of can inform our processes. So just want to say thank you to Trout Unlimited for partnering, the DNR for also partner, partnering and sharing information and ideas on this project. Um, our internal staff who worked um, pretty hard to get this bio sample for us last year, you know, it was kind of a last minute request um, and just kind of overall support of anybody who's been involved in the project. Um, I think it highlights how just really great partnerships and discussions amongst each other can fuel really good things. Um, we all bring something to the table, even though we have different reasons and needs for data collection, that putting it all together and working together will pay dividends. And I'm pretty excited to see how this project, um, the results in the coming years. So with that, I think I'll wrap it up and um, take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I think this it's a nice uh, presentation to close with because it's maybe a a little mini capture of what we hope more of our projects will look like where we get to do more of this collaborative sampling and effectiveness monitoring. It's, you know, it is hard to do. It takes some time and forethought and, and collaboration from partners to share data and bring things together. So um, really appreciate working with you on this project and also, you know, kind of getting that, that foundation laid for how this might occur in more project sites. Yes. Um, we did have a couple of questions come in for you. Um, one was looking at whether MPCA is considering sampling the habitat improvement projects post-project, even if there is um, pre-project data lacking, but looking at how IBI scores look post-construction and continue on any long-term uh, monitoring after that. Um, so we, we do have a few other places where we've, um, Kind of initiated some sampling. Um, so, you know, I'd be happy to talk about some of those places. Uh, there's a handful, uh, but typically we've tried to find places where we've had some pre project data or at least something. Um, and so that way we can compare after the fact. But, um, you know, there, there's a few different places now. I mean, I can think of a, a handful that, that might be of interest. So it kind of is dependent on the stream. Excellent. Um, another question asked whether whether the stream work will use any different techniques to improve your metrics. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think if I understand the question correctly, um, 
you know, the one slide that I had with all of the metrics kind of listed, um, I believe that the stream work um, could improve a number of those metrics. So it kind of just remains to be seen. Uh, once we gather that data, we'll be able to, to determine um, kind of how those changes occurred. But if I didn't answer that question, or if you want to rephrase that, feel free, because I'm not yeah. sure if I um, if I hit it or not. I wasn't certain either. If maybe they were getting at, um, and Mike, feel free to, to reiterate uh, whether we'd be making any changes to the type of restoration techniques used, um, thinking that they may be better, more aligned with moving the needle uh, on those metrics. But um, there's one, I'll jump ahead while, while we're thinking on that. Um, the Rice Creek photos show that the core problems that cause poor habitat are land uses. To what extent will the improvement project correct land use? Yeah, so, um, you know, my, my limited understanding of the project, or I'm not the, you know, the core person because we're not the one, you know, doing the project, but, um, you know, there's there's a few different facets of land use that I believe are contributing to the problem. And I think the one you're specifically pointing to is the pasturing. Um, and so the excessive grazing that's going on in the reach um, is clearly causing some issues. So um, my understanding is the project is going to have some designated cattle crossings um, and as, as part of the project. And so I think the theory is that that will hopefully um, keep the cattle from, you know, kind of full access and kind of concentrated in certain locations. So hopefully, um, basically we won't have history repeat itself, but um, that might be a better question for um, somebody at, at TU that's more involved in the project, but that's my understanding of what the proposal includes. Yeah, and I guess I can answer a little more um, broadly from TU's perspective. This one, because I'm new enough, some of the discussions on it predate uh, my knowledge too, but um, in general, when we'd have a, a site like that, we can walk through with the landowner different alternatives to help reduce that pressure on the um, on the resource immediately in that riparian area. Um, the concentrated crossing is one tool that can be used to keep cattle from just yeah wallowing through the entire stream reach. Um, there's also options to explore with fencing or, you know, increasingly, I think we're, we're trying to tackle the concepts of rotational grazing plans that, again, help rethink the way an area is being used that might allow it to just reduce the overall time spent and the, the overall pressure spent on those areas. I don't know the, all the particulars for the Rice Creek <laughs> project since that one was pretty well developed. Um, so I don't know how those discussions went on that project, but a um, couple more questions have come in. Uh, have you considered using the Minnesota SQT tool um, as a means to evaluating functional lift of a restoration comparing you know, pre and post SQT scores? Um, I don't know if you've looked at that stream quantification tool much, Tiffany. I have not, I've heard of it, um, but it's kind of been off the radar screen for a while. So I think it's something worth revisiting though. Um, so that's a good comment from Carl. So I'll put that on my my list of things to follow up on. Yeah, I'm, I'm also trying to get um, up to speed on that tool myself. Um, all right, Mike has a um, refinement trying to get at, um, Will a normal stream project get IBI improvements that you want, or does something different need to be done? Um, wondering about, yeah, how much how much you can export this example to other projects. So um, this is this is going to be a really good direct test of the effectiveness of the restoration techniques in changing those IBI scores. Some right. Point. I mean. I think that that's, it remains to be seen if we have the data to kind of even say anything on that. Um, we have, like I said, there's a couple other places that we have some data on that we haven't really put 
together yet. But as you know, no stream is created equal. They all have different issues. Um, they're not going to be exactly the same in how they respond. And so we're going to need a larger data set of these to start really understanding how much we can make a change um, on certain communities. And I think just highlighting too that, you know, in the case of Rice Creek, like I mentioned, it's going from, you know, pretty poor conditions to hopefully dramatically better. And some of these other ones might be harder to measure, you know, on a normal stream, you might be, it might be harder to see like an IBI score change just simply because the IBI score might be fairly good already. And then you change it and it's slightly better, but we have natural variability on our IBI scores just from year to year, there's differences in um, kind of what these streams are experiencing and the different stressors, they can vary. Um, we can have a huge flood event and that can change how things um, look in a stream. And so we have all these different variables to consider. And so I think it makes it really tough. And so until you have a, a large enough data set to really evaluate that, it's gonna be hard to say. Um, hopefully, like I mentioned, Doug Biederman's research project can help inform this kind of thing as well. So the more data that we continue to get and we collect on this, the better we're gonna understand it. So this is just, this, I think, scratching the surface really. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're gonna be doing a lot more of this type of, of documentation because I think it's, it's about being intentional on the front end of looking at what uh, stream techniques you're using um, and identifying where you're doing the monitoring and getting enough data points to try to see if you can separate the natural variability <laughs> from something that you can attribute to your project. That's a tall hill to climb. I guess we have one more um, question that came in asking if it's possible to just concentrate cattle crossings and improve vegetation without the other habitat improvement techniques. Um, they're curious if it would just take a little longer to see improvements. It would be helpful to distinguish which techniques are most effective. Yeah, yeah, that can get complicated and I think it depends on the stream. I mean, you know, just knowing things from a geomorphology standpoint, you gotta know where the stream is at in order to understand where it can go. And so some of these streams, I don't think can be restored unless you, you know, have you slope the banks and, and you do kind of more dramatic things. Certain streams potentially could recover themselves and you, you may be able to see improvements, but it all, I think is stream dependent. Um, but again, I'm not, that's just kind of what I know and me just kind of spitballing, but um, somebody that has more geomorphology and, and kind of does these designs or even somebody from TU that's really involved in the design of this stuff probably could give even more um, kind of information, but that's, that's kind of what I understand it to be. Um, so it's, it's not as simple as just, you know, keeping the cattle out and then the stream's going to heal itself. Sometimes we have seen streams heal themselves, you know, in different ways, but it all depends on where the stream is at. Um, and, oh, and another uh, chiming in from Ray White about the need for long-term monitoring, given that a project he's familiar with um, needed seven years after project completion to really show the response in the trout population as measured by abundance. Um, I think we, I've definitely seen that in my experience as well, you know, that the lag time can depend on what's going on in the, in the hydrologic cycle that you're in, <laughs> um, as well as how dramatic those changes were, how long is it taking for your vegetation in the riparian zone to recover. There are a lot of factors that would be driving when you might see your sort of peak recovery community. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I definitely think it depends on what you're looking at. Um, and so if you're looking at certain aspects, you're probably gonna need more data than other aspects. Um, so it just depends. I know um, DNR, Minnesota DNR has said they need five years, at least five years of data pre and post in order, because that's the trout life cycle is five years. So in order to understand that whole system, you need to have that much data. And that makes sense, you know, for IBI, if we're just looking at IBI scores, maybe we don't need five full years of data. So it really depends on what you're looking at, but I agree. I mean, as, as much long-term monitoring data as we can get, I mean, I'm in full support of more data. I'm always looking for more data. 
Well, we appreciate working with Minnesota and there is, um, you know, you, you've probably heard this, you know, all, all the states have different uh, resources available to them. And Minnesota is one place that has had a little stronger support for additional monitoring and research and, you know, even for restoration work um, with the Lassard Sam's funding. Um, for sure. So it's, it's a great place to be doing more of this work. <laughs> Yeah, we're pretty lucky, I think, with, you know, Clean Water Legacy is pretty much funded all of this, so. Let's see. I don't know if there are any more questions that have come in. I should have fixed this before now. Uh, yeah, and don't spend money sampling every year. Wait for five years. Um, yep. Duly noted. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for presenting, and and thank you to all the the speakers. Um, I just kind of wanted to close out um, telling folks, you know, I, I hope everyone has enjoyed the symposium. I have to admit, I was a little nervous trying to pull off the symposium in my first months of taking over the reins from Jeff Hastings. Um, and I think the success of the symposium is really reflective of the strength of this partnership, um, working to improve streams across the Driftless over the last 17 years. Um, you know, as you saw from our speakers um, both days, I mean, Jennifer today and Mike Miller yesterday, there have been landscape scale changes and erosion that have us in a place where we're still recovering. Um, but you also saw like from Kirk Olson's presentation yesterday that we have streams that have recovered. Um, there have already had significant recovery, I guess, in uh, the span of less than 100 years that were deemed unsuitable for trout and now I have actually quite abundant trout populations. Um, but we also saw there's still work left to do. Um, we have this highly private landowner landscape that we work in in the Driftless. So we do need to have uh, partnerships like this one that are collaborating with social scientists, meeting you know farmers and rural communities where they're at um, and working with private forest owners to manage their lands in a way that can maybe improve recharge into those groundwater networks that we were hearing about and hopefully measure that greater infiltration and recharge back to support and protect our groundwater resources. That's that's the heartbeat of our cold water heritage. So um, we definitely have some work to do restoring native species um, as well as you know protecting them from human impacts like you know, we saw yesterday presentations on new chemicals used in agriculture and in domestic, you know, human life that maybe are the newer threats um, to to species across the region. We've we've definitely seen huge improvements as a result of land conservation um, and 40 years worth of having the protections of the Clean Water Act. But um, I think we probably also see room for improvement in those places where we have non-point source management um, and some of those chemicals that are maybe the new challenges ahead of us after we've done such a great job dealing with legacy pollutants and you know metals and those compounds that have trended down now for the last 30 years. But I really um, just wanted to give a huge thank you to all of our presenters, not just yes. for presenting, um, but also just especially the work you're doing on the landscape that we're seeing reflected in these presentations um, to improve the health of our Drifilsaria streams. And also need to give a shout out to our team internally here at TU that helped pull this off. Um, as you all saw, I'm, I'm not great when I'm in charge of the controls, so. Uh, thank you so much to Doug for helping me run this thing sure. um, and our volunteer operations team, Jeff Yates and and actually numerous of other staff who've had their finger on pieces of this. Um, just really appreciate it. Um, and Jeff Hastings couldn't be here with us today. I was hoping I could draw on his wisdom for a few closing remarks, but um, just also want to acknowledge, you know, his great work in setting up this program that's now 17 years in um, is really a strong and mature partnership that is doing a lot of incredible work. So thanks to everyone. Um, we hope that we will see you all on the landscape soon. 